joining us tonight. I'm Megan Doherty. I'll wave. I feel like when there's a panel, it's hard to know on Zoom uh, who is talking. Although once I really start talking, it's not hard to know if I'm the one talking because I can't actually <laughs> keep my hand still. It's like pretty much impossible. I'm trying right now, but I'm already failing. So, um, but we'll try to be clear who's who's speaking when it's when it's the one of the three of us um, as we get into. It might be it might be possible to tell. But I didn't want to presume yeah, that. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but yes, the timbre of our voices is a little different. <laughs> um, so. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I am Megan Doherty, the director of the Museum of the White Mountains. It's great to have you here in person and those of you who are able to join us on Zoom. As we gather today, we're all on indigenous lands. For those of you joining us from home, I encourage you to learn more about the indigenous presence in your area, both past and present. Those of us at the Museum of the White Mountains are on Indakina, which is the ancestral and present homelands of the Abnaki, Penacook, and Wabnaki peoples. And we're grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waterways. For those of you on, the, on Zoom, we've put a link to a great resource to just begin your research about the history of your land. And I'd encourage everyone, if you can make the trip, um, we, two weeks ago, time's a little fluid right now, uh, went to Odenak, Quebec, and visited the Musée des Abneki in Odenak there. And it's really wonderful, wonderful place to learn about the Abnaki peoples, both past, present, and future. So I encourage a visit um, if you have a chance. Our event tonight kicks off three semesters of collaboration between the Museum of the White Mountains and the Sustainability Studies Program. And we're grateful that they wanted to partner with us on as part of their National Endowment for the Humanities Spotlight on the Humanities and Sustainability Studies Grant. And uh, tonight seems a perfect way to kick off a grant that's all about collaboration as we will spend the next hour or so talking about collaboration, how we all came together and what what it all means to to collaborate and what can what can come from that. And usually I would give a little kind of formal uh, bio of our speaker, but I think tonight I'm gonna skip that and we're just gonna dive into our conversation because it will, kind of come uh, organically out of uh, out of our conversation tonight. So just the briefest of introductions, I'm joined um, tonight. Usually I this is the point in our events when I disappear from the front of the camera. Uh, I was persuaded <laughs> to, to stay in front of the camera tonight. So um, I'll be in conversation tonight with Rita LaDuke and Rich Blundell. So we'll begin at the beginning wherever and whenever that might be. And so to, to get us started, uh, we'll come this way across the table and each talk about how this story starts. Mm. Okay, I guess I'll start then. Um, that's, it's a bit of a hard question, um, how it all began. I guess we're talking about origin stories. Um, I'm a big historian or a person who studies the, the history of the universe, cosmic evolution. And um, so for me, that question gets me thinking about origins. And, you know, I could tell you my origin story. I could tell you our collaboration's origin story. I could tell, we could tell. But I think it's, I think it's worthwhile to just for a moment acknowledge the bigger stories that these stories are embedded within. And the reason is because it's, it's instrumental. It's it's essential, actually, to the exhibition that's upstairs right now. Is that we're trying to we're trying to really emphasize and acknowledge the continuities between all things. And if you're going to do that, one of the best ways that I've found to do that is to tell the origin story that creates that continuity. In in my field, which is cosmic evolution, that starts essentially at the Big Bang. Um, I actually started a little earlier in the mystery before the Big Bang, but you know, let's just, we'll just assume that first miracle that there's anything at all and go from there, that there's this history of the universe that's 13.8 billion years. And it's a story of increasing complexity 
that starts essentially in light. And then that light evolves into matter. And then that matter becomes the material of the first stars. And then those stars organize themselves into things like galaxies. And within those galaxies, new things emerge through either supernovas or galactic collisions. New planetary systems form with planets in them, like Earth. I've just jumped ahead. So we've just done the first 10 <laughs> billion years, right? And now we're at, say, 4.6 billion years ago, the origin of the Earth. And um, what happened on the Earth? And, well, given enough time and circumstances and the, enough relational dynamics, molecules emerge and come together in ways where new structures, things like membranes, emerge from inorganic materials. Those membranes then go on to become proto-life. Life emerges from that. Then life proliferates. It, it withstands all kinds of um, challenges and disruptions and setbacks, but it goes on. There's this creativity that's inherent in nature and life picks up on that intelligence and uh, gets, a, gets a foothold First, unicellular organisms, multicellular organisms, then whole ecosystems of multicellular organisms. Dinosaurs come and go 65 million years ago. Um, continents collide, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. This region forms through volcanic activity and tectonic collisions and mountain building events. Plants colonize the land. Animals from the sea follow. Hubbard Brook forms, <laughs> and so like that's when the story. You know, this is our this is the origin story of this project and this collaboration. And then back in you know late sixties, my parents have a kid named Rich. <laughs> okay, jumping ahead. <laughs> and so then uh, yeah, and so then my story begins, and I grew up as a kid. Uh, mostly, you know, in Cape Cod, uh, really just a, ch a child of the forest down there. And you know, what's really interesting is I've been doing a lot of um, developing geologic courses, like geology courses for, I'm, I'm stationed out on Nantucket right now, and I'm telling the geology of Nantucket. I was asked to put, put together a course on the geology of Nantucket. But what I realized is I'm actually telling the geology of New Hampshire, because it's all down there in a pile. On the, in fact, Nantucket is a pile of New Hampshire geology. <laughs> and so anyway, um, uh, so I, was, I grew up down there uh, on the Cape, uh, very much in the woods, getting you know scraped up and bruised. And I spent a lot of time in the woods, not a lot of time in school, um, was not a good student at all. Had a little stint as a commercial fisherman. Uh, had a kind of an epiphany one day out on a boat and then somehow managed to get myself back into college study and to study geology, biology, ecology. Then I ended up traveling the world sort of on the science track. I became a natural scientist. Um, did a lot of teaching in East Africa, the Caribbean, South and Central America. Um, and then I got into the philosophy of science and then ended up getting a PhD in cosmic evolution down in Sydney, Australia. When I finished that, I was I'm just sort of a mutt. This is really, I'm not really hireable, but uh, I wanted to, you know, share what I had learned. And um, what I realized was that uh, I wasn't really getting a lot of um, enthusiasm from the scientific community. But when I, when I worked with artists, there was a spark in their eye. They had a certain tolerance for what I was doing. And so I started looking for artists and that's when I found Rita. I reached out to Rita. I saw her website. She was talking about how she loves nature and she has this really interesting process by which she creates art. And I could see in her process so much of like my own experience of being in nature. Uh, I could see symmetries that were really, really intriguing to me. And so I reached out to her and, um, and I just, I found someone really willing to like explore and listen and take what we were feeling and seeing and experiencing in nature, take it really seriously to, to try to understand it. So I guess that's the beginning of our origin story. Um, do you want to kind of pick it up from there, I guess? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so like, 
bat that he just like, <laughs> just casually dropped at our feet um, is the backdrop mm -hmm. and the foreground mm -hmm. of like this project. So constantly entering the headspace of expanded or extended continuities and stories um, is something that we, that's part of the practice. Like that's, that's what we've been doing with the forest for two years. Um, so it may seem like, why is he doing this? Why is he taking us this far back? Um, I ask myself that sometimes too, but it's, like I said, it's the background and it's the foreground and it's like, it is the thread by which this project has kind of blossomed. But once you have that, like you can't really go about the world. You know, we were just talking last night about how like you just, you can't even fathom what 13 billion, like 200 million, just try, like you can't. Mm -hmm. And so you can't think about that all the time as much as he might like to. Mm -hmm. um, so what's great is once you, once you can kind of accept it and hold it in a certain way, you can, you can start your origin story elsewhere because you know that it's a bit of a construct and then you get to kind of play with it. Mm -hmm. Then you get to kind of jump around. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to jump us around a little bit. So, so like we met, you know, we decided like, you know, is he okay? Am I okay? We're okay. Let's figure something out. Let's do something together. Is she safe to be in the woods? Like, well, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Really um, and so I guess, I guess now I'll jump. Back. So I'm an artist. I grew up um, in South Jersey near the Pine Barrens. Um, so kind of, you know, you're going to hear some parallels. Like I, I grew up, my parents really like enforced like creativity and participation with the world. Like that was kind of, you know, the problem solving tactic. Um, so just with that encouragement and with like a, a natural knack for like feeling the world and seeing the world visually and trying to figure it out visually, um, I decided to just go for it and to pursue art. Um, and so that took me to a lot of urban areas. I was in Philadelphia and then I was in Chicago and then I was in Brooklyn. Um, and when I was in Philadelphia, it was the first time I, mean, I was in a tiny, like a town population 2000. And so like moving to Philadelphia, I needed to figure out where, like how to feel like I felt at home. Um, and so my, my art practice took me outside because that was always the answer. It was always nature and creativity and merging the two. And so um, it was really kind of in these urban areas that I found my practice because I was looking for the thing that gave me the understanding and the answers and the well-being that it, that it gave me through trials and tribulations of my childhood. So, um, and, and beauty too, you know, like it was, it was everything. So anyway, so that, you know, so I became a professional artist. I got my MFA, moved to Brooklyn. Um, and then by the time we met, I had moved to the Hudson Valley. There was a kind of a tipping point where I realized like, why am I still in these urban areas? You know, I, I actually want to reimmerse myself in um, the forest. And so I, so I moved to the Hudson Valley and, um, yeah, I was, I was doing work at residencies. Like it was always, the work is always place-based. Um, and so I would go to different artist residencies, but what I would find is like, you know, you go to Oregon and then you make work that's place-based in Oregon. And then you go back to Brooklyn, nobody in Brooklyn wants to, show, why would they show work about a salt basin in Oregon, in Brooklyn? Like it was really hard to like, like, oh, I have this whole body of work. And so I was trying to figure out where can I go where there's like a community of people that care about a place that's already there, that's already developed. And at the same time we met and we started talking, let's, let's do something together, let's figure something out. Um, and we were introduced to Lindsay Rustad and kind of, she was really excited. She was the um, lead ecologist at Hubbard Brook at the time. She was really excited about bringing art in. And we were really excited about the idea of the experimental forest because we were about to embark on an experiment and we didn't know what was gonna happen. And it was really about like, okay, you have a practice of understanding the world or trying to understand the world. And I have a practice of trying to understand the world. And what happens when we try to understand the same place together? And so that was, that was the origin of, of the project. And we loved, because we didn't know what was gonna happen. We knew something was, we knew that if we could trust each other and the place, if we create this triangulated relationship with enough like, curiosity and vulnerability and trust and hold that story, hold that whole cosmic story and like revere it and really try to participate in it as part of it, that something would happen. We didn't know what it was going to be. And so it felt really that was, it was like a risk and it was an experiment and 
we were in it for the long haul. Like this is a long-term ecological research forest. And so we were like, what would happen if we did long-term ecological research that was merging kind of the sciences and the creativity. And so that's, that's what happened. And now we're here. And, <laughs> and I brought you here. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, we've, we've been talking for a while now, but, but recently about kind of origin stories and how did we get here? And, um, as, as many of you know, uh, some of you on, on this Zoom know quite well, uh, I, was born here, right? I was born in a small town, 300 people north of the mountains. Um, I suppose at this point in my life, I'm willing to say that it, I, I am from Dummer, New Hampshire. <laughs> we can have all the jokes later. Um, and, but I had to leave. Like I, 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 I had to, I could not stay. And I've been thinking a lot, you know, as we've been talking about how drawn we all are to these mountains, been thinking about why I had to leave. And I think it's it's about the future, which I think we're going to get to. And we're going to think about how we get from the Big Bang to the future all in one hour. Um, and, and I think so much of the conversation about the White Mountains is about their past, right? Whether it's their geologic past, whether it's... Um, you know, the, the history of tourism, the history of the region, the history of artists coming in the 19th century, right? It's all this very past-based narrative. And as an 18 year old, it's like, well, none of that's for me. I need to get out of here if I'm gonna have a future. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm not alone in, in that feeling. And, um, and I think that in part, your work, your project gives me kind of hope for the future, right? That there's there's ways to think about the future of the White Mountains and what you're doing that, I mean, I probably couldn't have seen it as an 18 year old if, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I'd encountered it, but that weren't apparent to me. And I think for me, I had to leave and come back and find myself through who knows what threads led me here um, at a museum, you know, directing a museum that's about this place that even if I had to leave it, it's always been home and and special. Like I've known that. Like as soon as I was gone, I was like, why am I in this land of gray? Like everything is gray. All of the South Side of Chicago is gray. It's just big and gray and gargoyles and like what what was I what was I thinking? Um, and and so so for our kind of you know I come into this story spring of 2022 of just you know getting my feet under me in a new role putting together an exhibition thinking about uh seasonality and change how the seasons change how the climate's changing looking for ways to tell that story in a forward-looking way not only talking about the loss and the way you know there was some of that in the exhibition but but also looking for ways to tell it, to tell that story, to think about that change, that tipping point um, in, in a way that wasn't just doom and gloom. And, and so I came across your work and also came across this, uh, you know, sort of a project I think you'd been involved with, with Brodo Art Sci collaboration and thinking about art science collaboration and how, you know, thinking about this kind of, so if you have this collaboration between art and science, how does it get out into the world? And what is, how do you sort of communicate that outside of, you know, you have this great stable collaboration and then, and then what? And I really saw the museum as the space to make that accessible, right? To, to make what you were doing in the forest accessible and that this seemed like the perfect place to do it. So we had those four animations the first summer and learning about your work, I learned about other things that were happening at Hubbard Brook. And then we had Field Station that was this kind of retrospective of the, the first 10 years of art science collaboration at Hubbard Brook. And, and now we're kind of taking a deep dive into, into what the two of you are working on with the forest. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you think that what we're doing fits the model of art side that you had originally 
like art science meaning like when artists collaborate with scientists um does it did we disabuse you of the idea <laughs> that we were an outside project yeah and and if so like how like how has your how has it evolved for you in terms of like well and i think what what we saw in field station was this kind of spectrum mm -hmm. like there's a spectrum of what that looks like the um the, and that they're they're expected outcomes mm -hmm. and ex so we if we think about art science collaboration first things first often is kind of data visualization right, right essentially graphic designers helping scientists to communicate their results, right? Mm -hmm. Or we think about other kinds of, you know, visualizations of, of data, not necessarily in a, you know, in a, whether it's video or things like that, or we think about um, scientific illustration, right? That's like another kind of expected um, outcome. And, and the great thing about that exhibition was then we had other things that pushed on that in different ways, right? Not just your project, but other other pieces of what what we had in that exhibition pushed on those expectations in in different ways. And and I think that what what you guys are doing is is like well, setting all that aside and saying what if, what if we actually don't think about this as a binary. And think about what is like synthesis and the sort of dissolving of boundaries rather than like holding these two things at, in this like tense binary. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm piecing some things together. Like, so first of all, it just hit me like you returned here. We neglect, neglected to mention that we both have histories in the White Mountains. Mm -hmm. um, so so coming here together to work on a project was significant for both of us. All three, all of us. Well, yeah. Right, so, yeah. and that, yeah. so, so like that was really amazing to have that happen all the kind of, because we came fall of 2021. You came, right, which is when I came to interview for this job, yeah. October so like, 21. That's kind of crazy. But like the phenomenon that, that you're describing, there's a consistency here of like, when I just talked about the cosmic story and being able to kind of kind of jump around it once you kind of hold it. Like there's these binary, like like we kind of assumed the role of the artist and the scientist, but then we but then we kind of broke it open. Like sometimes I'm the more pragmatic one and he's like creative, you know, like kind of out there. Like it, you know, and and so the it, the boundaries are constantly blurring. So there's this this constant dance that I hear you talking about. I hear you talking about and I feel of like okay, we're going to, uh, we're going to accept the construct, we're going to break the construct, we're going to accept the and, and then and like when you do that, that is what puts the whole, suddenly you can see this hole that, that, I mean, I don't want to say it tells you something because there's not like a thing to, to get, but it like offers something that is fuller than anything you could ever get. If you just accept the construct and stay within that. So if you, if you never move back or you never, the, the jumping around or the entering in and exiting out like that kind of breathing, um, yeah, it like breathes life into it. I guess I would just want to expand out what you were starting there about the, the art side collaboration and how I think what we're trying, what we're not what we're trying to do, but what we're end up doing is expanding out the different ways in which artists and scientists can can collaborate. Like you mentioned, there's these sort of simple ways in which artists can come in and be the visualizers and the, you know, be the artists to serve the science. And then there's other ways in which artists can actually participate in the scientific research, help help scientists do with their research design. They can help generate ideas on research questions. And that's a really important in our active participation in the scientific process. Then there's other ways which are like, how do we sort of inspire the next generation of STEM? You know, young people get them inspired about science. And how do we share also like the excitement of discovery? This is one that we got from Lindsay Rustad about how can we share the excitement of the scientific process? Those are all really important ways in which artists can work with scientists. But then we want to go way beyond that. And so what we do after that, we, we put all that sort of what I, we just described in a sort of in the center. And then we have this thing called the sublimation layer, which you can kind of think of as like a paradigm shift. And we're, we're, we're operating outside of all of that and saying, no, actually, we want to collaborate with the whole of science and art to shift the consciousness of humanity toward a different way of being in the world. That's not typical art side collaboration, okay? <laughs> like, we want to, like, use this project 
to show people how to have a more meaningful relationship with nature that can help solve deep systemic problems that are like becoming existential to our species. That's not written into most arts I proposals. Well, and, I, and I'm gonna say something I know is true for you, and I wonder actually now if it's true for you, but like, why did you go get your PhD, Rich? Like, why did you go into science? And why did I go into art? And like, we've talked about the fact that like, we went into these things, not because, so to speak for myself, like art is not the end goal. Like art is the byproduct of the search for meaning for the bigger thing. And for you, like, so it's art is like the, the tool, art is the my language, that's how I, I search. Science is that for you. I'm wondering how this is resonating for you, but I think like, cause what he just said sounds so big, but like just on personal scales, it doesn't feel big to us because it's what, it's just what we've always done with our craft, with our practice. That's what I'm saying. It sounds like a perfect job for art, frankly. That's why, um, that's why right. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm looked for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think for me, you know, I ended up in art history because it was a way to tell stories about people, right? Like I came in through the door of material culture. And so thinking about understanding the past through the everyday things, mm -hmm. right? Through our clothes, like mm -hmm. how is it that there's, yeah. And like that, that there's something we can know about the past by studying this kind of residue. And it's not just in... I was never really, don't, don't take this the wrong way. <laughs> I was never really interested in oil paintings. Um, but, you know, it was it was the kind of stuff of every day that, that got me interested in art history. And then thinking about working in museums as a way to tell those stories. And, and I think the thing that's kind of kept me in museums is the collaboration, right? We're like circling back around to the beginning here is because you get a PhD in a humanities field, you spend your life in a library, Carol, and you spend your life alone in the library, Carol, and it's you and old books in my case. Um, and and it, it's a very isolating. Well, that's kind of what we're trying to address here is that the humanities don't stop, they, they don't start and they don't stop there. What, why? Why is it? Why do they stop? Where, what is this artificial division between where natural history and human histories? There's no real boundary between those two disciplines. And I think that it's been a real disservice and we're really starting to feel the impact, the injury of that, that false dichot, that false division between natural history and human history. Do you, do you like well, that's, that's why I ended up signing scientific illustration, right? This this like okay. gets us back to why I think this has uh, worked right, so well right, is right. because you know my academic background is not is looking at scientific illustration and how artists are were critical in the 17th century for communicating new knowledge that the kind of we will for lack of a, for a shorthand. So we, I don't have we, to say we, natural. We philosophy. have a theory. We we have a theory that actually. The, the era that you were working in, that you were excavating in, was a, an early time for science. It was young. It was the 17th century. Yeah. It was enlightenment science. Pre-enlightenment. Pre-enlightenment. So it was yeah. super young. It was yeah. adolescent. Yeah. And the people who were doing it didn't have the institutionalized segregations that we have, that we've inherited, right? And so there was a there was a vitality to it. There was a there was, you know, it was, it was alive and it was, it was, it, it had all that energy. And like, so you've been mingling and you've been steeping in that. Right. And so now we come along and we're in that. Right. We're, right, we're, we're like crossing those boundaries again. And so that's our theory is that's why you're secretly <laughs> excited by this. <laughs> yeah. Because we're yeah. trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to figure it out. I think that's right because I think that, and that was something you know. What was it? What was it? Years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Robert Hooke, you yeah. know, best known if he's known for. Any, I mean, I guess there's like a there's some chemistry laws, but whether you retain those is a whole other thing. But um, he's he's you know best known for his gigantic microscopic images, right? So the flea 
that folds out and is like a bottle. Talk about experience. fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think it's true, right? He trained as a painter. He, you know, did all his own, lots of his own drawings for his scientific experience. He was the curator of experiments for the Royal Society. And I think that kind of lack of divisions is definitely what drew me to the 17th century. And I think what you're saying about the kind of human history is natural history, that line, and I think the ways in which they were trying to understand the world by describing it, right? And but I think we're now starting, starting to we're starting to really feel the injury caused by that. And we're, at some point, if we make it, we're going to look back at that whole era and be like, "Boy, that was unnecessary. That was sort of a, that was a wrong turn. That was a that was a detour." And we're trying now to like come back to reunite to 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 create the continuities between nature and humans by by traversing the whole story of how nature became humanity, how nature became art. In fact, art is nature's creativity. You know, like that's what you see up there on the, on the walls is you're seeing the creativity of the, of Hubbard Brook, the forest showing up through the artist on the walls. That's the extending. Yeah. yeah. That's just about to be like, oh, yeah. We've done it. We made it to our okay. second question of the evening, <laughs> which is that I wanted us to kind of parse the title of the exhibition. So this talk is worth three, Three days, Friday, so. yeah, three days before um, this exhibition opens. And so the exhibition is titled Extending Ecology, Making Meaning with the White Mountains. And I had to stop about three times and make eye contact with Rita to make sure I had those words in the right order because- The carefully chosen words. They're carefully chosen. We spent a lot of time working through what exactly the title of this exhibition was which preposition in particular we wanted that to be, whether we wanted ecology to be the, so a previous iteration of your collaboration was called Ecology Extended. Mm -hmm. So why did we decide that we were extending ecology rather than ecology had been extended? Yeah, I mean, because we're still doing it. Like, <laughs> I mean, I talk about myself as a conduit or like a sensor through which like, like, so there's a, the project, like we were you know, emissaries. We use all these different words to describe this idea that we're kind of going in and absorbing and listening and participating. And then we, we like get something out like meaning we get meaning, which we'll get, we'll get there. Um, and we need, it's like, you can't just hold it. Like, so it needs to, there's this like, um, just impulse to like extend it. Like it's just however you you can. And so, yeah, so ecology extended. It was like, well, it, that was kind of back when we were like, is it going to extend it to us? Like, I think that's what it made sense at that time. Like, we're going to go in this experiment. We're going to do this experiment. We see if ecology extends. Is it going to extend it to us? Well, it did. And so now we're extending it further. Um, so I think that's kind of what was happening when, when we decided, we were like, oh yeah, no, it has to be extending ecology. It's still happening. And, and actually the hope, I mean, we have got like, you know, Nikki and Michelle are coming and they, like, they will now do a performance in response to the exhibition. They are now receiving it, extending it. Like, how can we create this? You throw a stone in the, the brook and it ripples out. Like it, the brook is forever changed. Like, how can we do that ourselves? Like that's, that's participating in the story. Right. So like, yeah, I would also add that um, this kind of goes back to um, Descartes, who's like the bad guy. He's, he's sort of the villain here. He was the guy that sort of made, made this big separation between, you know, material and and mental. And the term extension or extended is, it's speaking back to that idea that, you know, they believe that the mind is an extension of matter. That, and and it's, it's, it's that too. But it's ecology extended. So what we're doing in this, our, in our sort of understanding, ecology is really a matrix of relationships, and it's from those relationships. In fact, it's the the relationships are essential. If you look, and I know this because if you look at the entire history of the universe, nothing happens without relationship. We can go all the way back to the 
cosmic microwave background radiation, which is like the first documented relationships of light in the universe. And it's from those relationships that the first stars emerged. And that story extends all the way to here. But the point is just that nothing happens without relationship. Relationship is creativity. And so with embedded within those relationships is a kind of intelligence. It's the intelligence of nature that existed before our intelligence. We think of ourselves as intelligent and we are, but it, it's our, we are extending nature's intelligence. And so we're picking up on that idea of extending the intelligence of nature into this building. So we go out and we, and we were with that intelligence in the forest and we open our intelligence to it and it, it we embody it, it gets into us. And the idea is that it's a creative intelligence and that, in creative, that creativity then extends into us. And then we create and the, what we create then can, it embodies that intelligence. And then that intelligence ends up on the wall on, in, of the exhibition. And then the idea is that people come in and then they engage with that intelligence. And this is a cult, this is a space of cultural cre creation. Art creates culture, and that's what's going on here. And so the idea there is that we're extending the ecological intelligence of that forest through us, through the art, into other human beings who then go out and create a culture. And the idea ultimately is that that culture then will be infused with the intelligence of nature and that our culture will be more aligned with nature because of that in some small way. Um, because a culture that's not aligned with nature is gonna be a pretty short-lived culture, which is kind of where we can see the glimmers of that now. Yeah, and I think I wanna maybe pick up on that, like what does it mean to be aligned with nature? And I, I wanna to try to tie it in to the word collaboration because there's something, there's certain, expectations or standardizations that are starting to happen with the understanding of what a collaboration is and looks like. And the collaboration with Rich and the forest, I would call it an ecological collaboration. And, and there's, there's something that's happening where we're like, we're doing this dance together where like sometimes we stay in our own lanes and we just like play next to each other. And like, I call it parallel play. Like we just don't, bother each other we just let each other do our things and we respect that but we also like get like you still it still kind of starts to get into you um other times we're directly collaborating and bouncing things back and forth and with the forest too and so and so there's this like porosity like we we become permeable um but it's a dance like sometimes sometimes those pores tighten and sometimes they open and other times like i jump over here and he jumps over and and the and, like so it's ecological um and so the word with was important because obviously the, like we keep talking about the forest, it's our third collaborator. This couldn't have happened without like all of the, and I'm going to, I'm going to hand you over the meaning word, but, um, but this couldn't have happened without the with, like we really had to feel like we were participating with the forest. The forest was letting us in. We were opening up those pores and this collaborative dance was happening. Again, it goes back to that, like that breathing and that breath. Um, but like when he says, would you say being nature or, or natural? Like when he talks about re re reflecting nature in what it is we're doing, that ecological way of collaborating is different than these sort of standardized ways that collaborating is starting to become like, you know, what is a collaboration? Check off these boxes. Um, and so I just, it's different. And so when he talks about nature and reflecting nature, it, we're trying to trickle it up because this, this ecological way of being and relating and having relationships is so much more real and like alive and, and, it furthers life just in the way that he described it in the cosmic story. And so if we don't reflect nature and be nature in how we interact with each other, that will get severed. And if that gets severed, like we're in trouble. And I think, you know, I don't know, you could pick it up from there. Sure. Um, the other thing, I guess I, the other thing I would add to that is that when you do this, you realize you're not just collaborating like, it's not, we're collaborating with an incredibly powerful creative force 
the creative force of nature that created us. So it's not, there's no more powerful force to create, to collaborate with than that. And so I just think, and talk about meaning, like, like one of one of the people, one of the, we, we work in a lot of different sort of communities out there on the web. And there's this one cognitive scientist that we deal with and he's coined the, the meaning crisis, that we're in a meaning crisis, our culture's in a meaning crisis. And I guess that's true. But when you spend time in collaboration with nature and you feel its creative force, you're like meaning crisis. We are so awash in meaning and beauty and creativity. And it's just absurd that we would find ourselves in a meaning crisis when we are the recipients of this story of nature, like, and it's in us. And like, here we are, like at the cusp of this, like, we, and by the way, this all of this is unfolding in a moment when technological advances are about to just completely disrupt everything we think is normal. Like, we're, in the next decade is going to be so different than this decade. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm not sure if this is picking up where you left off, but no, it is. This is what, I, what did you yeah, do there? Yeah, I, I guess I'm just saying that. Uh, yeah, that's what we're doing here is 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 trying to demonstrate what it means to to reconnect with this natural, we call it the, the creative life force of the universe. And that's like, sounds like woo woo, but that's like, no joke. I can say that as a scientist, you know, that we're, we're, we're collaborating with the creative life force of the universe and trying to make it palpable. Um, yeah, I want to like just reiterate how like in our origin stories, we each went into our respective fields in order to find this for ourselves and like, we go to place and we listen and we, tr and, and it, you know, it created, like, it's just, there's such a, it's like a, there's a humility and like a reverence and like, a, a and it's just all you want to do is like, listen and, and hear it. Like it's sort of like this, the rigor, like we just, we're like, we can't not go because it's, it gives us and so the meaning is is like is the, and so that's the meaning with again I guess. It's like, Can I just point out we're doing this at an at an at a long term ecological research station that normally only does science. So she just used the word humility, reverence. We're talking about joy. We feel a lot of gratitude, beauty, all these words that you don't associate with scientific research. So we're like we're like walking, we're like kind of walking that fine line too. Like what are you guys doing here? Like that doesn't. That's not what we do here, but that's what we're doing there. And, you know, Hubbard Brook, the, the, the environment, the experimental forest has a history of really innovative groundbreaking research. That's why we know about acid rain. And that's, it's because of Hubbard Brook and the research that happened there. That's largely why we got a handle on it. It's why you don't hear about it as much anymore it's because of the work and the research that was done at Hubbard Brook. And we think, but this work that we're doing about reconnecting us to nature is could be just as important and profound, but in a completely different way. It's about if this is what, and this is the experimental part. Like Hubbard Brook is an experimental forest. Well, this is the experiment of our time. Is can we get people to fall back in love with the earth, nature, and and let the benefits of that relationship trickle up into the intelligence of our civilization. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I would say- That's like, meaning, by the way. I mean, I mean, if that's not meaning, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. That's meaningful work. That's meaningful research. Right, and so like, just as in the beginning when he gave you the whole 13.8 billion year story, like he keeps expanding it out, but I'm just gonna like, bring it back in and be like, okay, I, I could listen to him as someone who's not me and be like, that sounds like so big and so such a statement. But I'm sitting here knowing that when I go and practice and participate with the forest, that what he just said happens to me. It happens to me. And I can't deny that. Like, I know it happens to me. So the question is kind of like, how can we scale it? Or how can we at least um, offer it back out, communicate it, share it in some way, because it's not, we can't just keep it to ourselves. It's not what it's there for. Um, it's actually kind of impossible to do that. So how can we, Megan? 
I think that's where I come in. Yeah. Right? <laughs> isn't this isn't this the role I play in this? It's, that's why we're here. Is by providing space, right? right. And and a and, and a different kind of place, right? Like this Good is point. yeah, yeah. And providing an entry point into what you're doing and also an entry point for our kind of multifaceted community, right? The museum kind of holds different communities together. Um when as we're at this kind of boundary uh between campus and town between you know students and the community and folks who live here and folks who come here to visit and and i think that's you know this is all why i was so excited to bring this project here because it seems to me that this is the place it makes the most sense mm -hmm. to provide a platform for that because the folks who come through our door they're like three quarters of the way. Well, maybe maybe three quarters is a lot, but <laughs> although they're they're already on their way with you because they care about this place, mm -hmm. right? You walk into the door of the Museum of the White Mountains because you care about the White Mountains, right? Mm -hmm. There's like something about this place that, you know, whether you're here and we're like the perfect rainy day activity, or you're here because you chose to come here for college, right? I chose to go to Chicago for college. 4,500 other people chose to come to Plymouth, New Hampshire for college, right? So they've already made that that choice in our in our students, and um, and and so I think that we like we're already on the path with you here at the museum, and so thinking about how we can, and this is where you know I see the hope and the future, right? That this isn't just about what happened 13 billion years ago. It's how do we equip ourselves for the world that's coming and how do we get to a place where we can make choices that make it so there's continues to be a world in in the future and a world we can recognize mm -hmm. and even if it's not exactly what we recognize but we can still exist i want to point out something that you said that's like yet another fractal which is like the way that you just described this museum and the ecosystem of this museum, that it's liminal, that it's like, I call it like hallway space, that like there's, there are so many, it's a, you talk about it's a museum of a place. It's not a museum, it's not an art museum, it's not a sign. It doesn't exist in a silo. It It's this ecological space. Mm -hmm. And so it just, it's just been so like, it's like capillary action. If we're in the forest, existing in ecological relationships together and with the forest and we've got this project and it's all in this ecological yeah, relationship dramatic. and then it and then it enters into this museum that is also existing in this liminal way and with the exhibition we tried to like create a space that also is liminal doesn't really lean too far right too far left too far science too far art too far history like it's just trying to be not it's trying to be not. <laughs> um, and like the museum is being not. And like we are being not. I'm not an artist. He's not a scientist. I am an artist. He is a scientist. And like, what is that? Even? And so when the question is like, how, how do we future? Like, that's how we future. We be not. I don't know. Now I sound crazy, but we like, you know, we we exist in this liminal space together and and create ecological relationships that mimic those that have taught us how to be for 13.8 billion years. I think we should open it up to questions. I feel like that felt very like, ooh, yeah. That was like a great summation cool. of what we're doing here or what we're not doing here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, unless, are there things we... Uh, I guess um, you had brought up earlier about wanting to talk about how the humanities can play a role in sustainability and you know, to kind of touch that, to touch that question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this does or can potentially do that by restoring humanities to a, you know, restoring it to really a, an essential place. In fact, elevating it again, be in, you know, in some sense beyond the sciences again, to restore its place as a, uh, a force for humane a humane reality okay um but by but in order to do that it needs to restore its roots into nature again you know and and restore the kind of like the natural order of 
humans in nature, as part of nature, as nature. Like, and that, if you're going to talk about sustainability, we need to be asking ourselves, why aren't we sustainable? So instead of trying to like create sustainability, ask, a, ask deep questions about why, why have we become the only unsustainable species, organism <laughs> on this planet? And I think it boils down to, well, just do the quantitative analysis. We consume too much. That's why we're unsustainable. Well, why do we hyper consume? Well, because we some, we feel we feel, we feel hungry or we feel unfulfilled by so we try to fill the unfulfilled feeling, and that's what we're trying to do here too is to say, you know, a relationship with nature is pretty fulfilling, and it tends to attenuate, it tends to alleviate that that sense of I got to consume something in order to feel home, feel feel full. You don't. You just need to relate in a different way with the world. And that's what we're trying to kind of communicate through this work is mean it, how to find meaning again. That's a humanities, that's a humanities endeavor, but it's infused with science. There's a there's a there's a video room up there that says, and outside it says every syllable of this exhibition is infused with science. It's not just science, but a scientific worldview. It's not just one research agenda or one outcome of some stuff. You know, nitrogen is hugely popular at Hubbard Brook. The word nitrogen doesn't show up up there, upstairs. But it, we're excited. We're, we're, what's the word? We're, we're, we're excited about nitrogen. What's the word? What did they say? We're nuts about nitrogen. Is that it? We're nuts about nitrogen too. But knowing about nitrogen, we need more than that. You know, we need to feel at home again, not just know that nitrogen's a problem. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do here too, is to like really um, what's the, um, consummate the scientific the promise of all this scientific knowledge by bringing meaning to it um, through the arts. So yeah, that's so that that's why it's still. A, that's why it's still a humanities and sustainability endeavor and, and, and worth supporting in that way, I think. Yeah. Thanks. So there we are, our first uh, spotlight on the humanities and sustainability studies event. And Rich has tied it all up neatly in a bow for us. <laughs> and um, we, I think we're, we'll transition to questions. Um, Kayla or Jade, would you pull up the chat and help me kind of manage? This is where the I can't be in two places at one time part of uh, hosting an event is going to come in. Um, wow. And are there any questions out there? Yeah, there's any, questions. Look at those and yeah, I'm not working. yeah. Is there any, anybody have any? Additions or questions or anything? Do you have a vision of like what are some actionable steps that you would like to see taken by the scientific community in response to your work? It's a great <laughs> question. I mean, there's a lot of answers that come to mind. Um, I just don't, I don't want to be flippant. <laughs> well, I mean, my answer was almost like they don't need to. Like they're doing yeah, really important point. work. And they need to do that work. And I think, and I think, you know, like even art side collaboration needs to happen. Like, like there's a place for all of this. Um, we're just trying to figure out ours. Um, so I think just let us do what we're doing, yeah. you know, and 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 take us seriously. Not you don't have to like even take us seriously, actually. Just, just get out of the way. Don't stop us. And um I think if you pay attention, if you let us do what we're doing, you will come to appreciate what we're doing. And you will realize that we're not, we're not doing pseudoscience. We're not doing science at all, actually. And we're not, we're not the enemy. We are trying to really value the knowledge that good science produces. We're trying to, we're trying to really elevate the value of the knowledge that's being produced, but not get bogged down with the, the, the more less pressing questions. Just do good science 
and and let let us like let us operate in the cultural sphere on the periphery, which is what did, enabled us to do. And so I need to I need to really emphasize how much we appreciate the way that the Hubbard Brook community has opened up this opportunity. And you know, we we, we really are determined not to let them down, you know, and to do anything that's like unscientific. But we're not doing science. We're doing communication of science. Um, and I just think that, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's not a practical step, but but I guess just get out of the way. <laughs> in, a, in a friendly way. Well, yeah, I mean, you when when Rich tells the story some in some of the workshops we do, he uses science to make space for the creativity. And I think that's that's part of what I would like to see happen in all disciplines. So it's not always the case that the boundaries should be blurred. Sometimes you do need to stay in your lane and do your work and do your work well, mm -hmm. but there's room for everybody at the table. And so again, it's that sort of that ecological shifting and balancing and dancing so that no one feels scarce. No one feels shoved out of the way. It's actually just like, no, the more the merrier. Um, yeah, I think that. Yeah. And by the way, as somebody who's trained in the sciences, I understand that impulse to want to protect science, the rigor of science. I get that 100% because way too often what I'm trying to do gets misappropriated by one thing or another. And so I get that. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't want to make, turn this into a, you know, yeah, I think it's like it's the it's the mentality of abundance, like allowing for this this space where we can kind of coexist and do what we came here to do in our own individual ways of understanding this place, so that we can piece it back together and get that meaning that's going to help us figure out the future. And we're not even asking for funding, so <laughs> just let us. Yeah, actionable. We get us on the phone with NSF. That would be helpful. <laughs> yeah, write write them onto your NSF. I, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to take funding away from this funding of it's good true. science either, though. We, you know, this is a different endeavor. Yeah. Kayla, can you scroll up to David's? Um... So David had a comment about. Um, early modern, but then I wanted to think about uh, extending a little bit more and extending also has etymological connections to stretching in time, extending the time to take, we take to dwell within the intelligence of nature. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great piece of this because I think that that's another thing that happens when we went with Jaron, right? To get, we didn't really get all the way into the grammar, mm -hmm. um, but, but the, it's that openness that extending has, um, both in in terms of, of space, but also time. I think is really great, and just wanted to kind of touch back to that in in David's comment. So it implies like slowing down. You mean and so what's the word? Not silencing, but um, just quietness or what? Well, and I think. I think partly it's that, right? It's like taking the time to be quiet, but I think also this idea that it's boundless, right? Like it's extending. Yeah. It just keeps, like there's no yeah. end, which, which I really- Which goes to the, the consuming thing. Like, yeah, so like you can be filled up with nature's meaning, but what gets you there is being filled up, at least for me, sensorially. Like it's so, when you really shut off and open up, it gets in and you're like yeah. so full that you actually like, I want my house to have nothing in it when I come back in from the forest because there's just, you know, I'm swimming in multi-sensory everything. And, and, then, and then the meaning is a fractal of that that comes with it. I think where that definition of extending really applies to, or at least where I experience is in the intelligence as extending. Like we think of intelligence as like us, like we're the ep epitome of intelligence. But when you go into the forest or any ecosystem, any healthy ecosystem, and you feel that threat, man, there's an intelligence there. That's so much like there's a deep intelligence. That's like limitless intelligence. 
that's at work there. And it's, it doesn't end with us. And so we're going to need to come to terms with that, 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 that intelligence is, it's there for us to participate in or, or not. But um, yeah. So thank you, David, for that, because I, I definitely see that sense of extension in, of intelligence. It's, inex, it's inexhaustible. So. It's like so generous, you know, like, and so you just, it's the, then the gratitude, you know, and then it's just, so it's just a cycle. <laughs> the meaning yeah. kicks in. Yeah. yeah. I have a question that I think Marsha actually posted up there and got me thinking, um, how do you, Let's pull back to as the artist, right? Like going in and whether you're the artist now and the scientist now, whatever it is, but how do you take everything you're feeling? What are your techniques for actually capturing that and putting it up on the walls? Like I haven't seen anything up there, but how do you take something that is existential is so beyond humans, but yet you're you're communicating with your humans, you are humans, so you're at the center point of whatever you're gonna embody. How do you remove that layer of just like Humans, too many. I mean, you should let us know if if we did it okay, because <laughs> um, we tried. Um, but I mean, for me, it just always comes back to like, how do I need to do it for myself? Yeah. Like, so I'm trying. We're like, we're we process things as humans, right? Like, I'm so I'm just I'm trying to understand. I'm searching and I'm trying to process what I've what I've gathered and then spit it back out and then get more and and the, and there's these conversations and this triangulation and all of these and so um in order to understand it i have to visualize make you know i collect so i go and i collect like data it's like visual data and i play with those back in the studio like we, we have conversations and like you know some like Sometimes I'll like save text threads or like take notes or but just there's just a constant, just like in the forest, everything is in constant movement, change, flux. Like the relationship, the conversation is again with the forest as well, is in constant. It's like it's just this constant swirling. And so so the what you see upstairs is like the byproduct of it's almost like as this thing is if you picture a tornado and things get kind of shot out of it as it goes like <laughs> it's kind of like so so there's that so that's kind of how we end up with concepts um and object like art objects um but then for the exhibition you know there was a whole just thought process on okay how now do we make this presentable what's the phenomenology of the space that we want to create for other people how do we extend the the phenomenology that we feel in the relationship this ecological relationship how do we create a space that might also be like a not space part of what we were really trying to do was i was like guys i just don't want it to feel like an art show like it's not an art show it's not a science museum exhibition it's not a history natural history like it's none of those things so how do we create a space so that when somebody walks in it disrupts all their narratives of of what they think it is. Um, and so we tried to make decisions. I think both of you can speak maybe a little bit more on those decisions. We tried to make decisions that would help keep people in this liminal space. The tricky part of that is that the, the entry points aren't going to, not all, not, no one can get through every single entry point that we've offered. So some sometimes there are inaccessibilities, but other times, but, but the hope is that there are multiple accessible entry points for any given person who can kind of come in and engage and I think one of the things to to note as well, especially for folks who haven't seen the exhibition, but when you do see the exhibition, is that um, it could feel like it's not just one artist, mm -hmm. right? They're pretty distinct bodies of work because they're from different moments. They're different approaches to the forest, right? Winter is a very different time in the White Mountains than, than the kind of season of fecundity and mushrooms and fruiting bodies everywhere, right? Like you feel the forest very differently. And so so you you can, I hope, I think, I feel that in different parts of the exhibition, you, you kind of feel the different moments of the forest and the work looks very different. Um, and then the panels, that Rich has written and that Emma Wilbur, our student graphic designer, has has designed 
provide you with a portal into that moment. It's not the only portal. It's not, it's not, there's nothing definitive about what, what we're doing. It's not, we aren't saying think this way about the art or the art is meant to be this, but rather here's an opening into a conversation that we'd like to invite you into. Um, and as Rita says, like it won't all work for everyone. Um, but the hope is that with these different portals, there's a space for each of us to see a model we might replicate of being in the natural world of, of and listening. That's part of being in, in nature is that it doesn't like just yesterday, you know, we're hiking and he went one way and his leg span is bigger than my eye. So that like, it didn't work for me. I had to go over, like, eat, like, so we just see these things replicating and scaling in different ways as we like, re so it's, it's just like, yeah, in a forest or in anywhere in nature, not everything is pleasant. Not everything is there for you. Not everything is meant to like, it's just, and so you're, you're constantly adapting too. And so I think, and to the point about the, you know, the work, I, there was there was a time where that was like a really horrible thing for somebody to come into your studio and be like, it looks like this was made by five different people. And you know, I'm like, oh no, I need to figure out how to make art that looks like it was just made by one person. But no, because when you are engaging with relationships that change, the work actually should look different every time you engage because then you're responding to the change. Um, and so the panels that, you know, the, the text that Rich wrote does a really nice job of like creating this kind of con thread of continuity and conversation and entry points through words, um, but then moments of distinction um, as well. So, yeah. Can I just, I just want to make sure that your that was your question. Like your question, what was your question? As somebody who hadn't seen what was about this <laughs> Uh, my own avenue through which you can proceed with that. And I was just curious how you did it, how, what your craft was. So yes, that was it. Okay. So, but you could follow up. So, cool. so we just explain how she does it. Yeah. But then how do you engage with, I'm assuming you engage with the work that she has and that you were involved in maybe an earlier process of that and then connecting them all. So. I heard a different question. I, Maybe it's a better question. You should go with that. I was uh, the question that I heard said something to do with how do you how do you find the continuity between the work and you know sort of as a human and nature dealing with the subject of nature how do you how do you find the continuity and maintain you know like your own integrity as a in, as an identity while also collaborating with nature as a collaborator. Like, was that not? No, nope, that's a great question. <laughs> I think there, was a, there was a layer of that because there was like a, you know, you're thinking about this creative intelligence in, in nature, but you're filtering it through a human. Right. So, so yeah. That's the human part. Yeah. And that, I, I come from that sustainability perspective. Like, humans are getting the things wet. You made that clear, right? You're an own problem, whatever. So, how do you try to, you know, evoke this feeling of reconnecting? Right. While not, you know, in a certain way, you want to divorce yourself from being human to try to engage That's with what I, them are humans. That's why. Right. And my answer to that would be if you know the story of how we came to be, like if you really know some details, and then you it becomes inescapable that you are nature. You don't walk around thinking, I'm in nature. You, there's a part of you that lives as nature, as belonging. There's this like really abiding sense that I belong here. And I take that, I, I take that for granted. I like, that's my ground assumption. That's my, that's the deepest sort of like, that's the deep expectation that I hold because I happen to know I can trace in a very continuous, logical, propositional series of events, how I came to be an expression of the same forces that are, are at play in the forest as it decomposes or the, you know, the fungi and the, the mushrooms in the tree or the, the way the birds sing. And, and it's just like, this is, this is, this is me. You know? And so, and I, apparently that's not ubiquitous, apparently. <laughs> okay. And so I think that is what we're working, we're doing here. And I'm constantly reminding Rita of that by telling her, 
the science that I happen to know, how, you know, there's a, the, do you know about the phospholipid bilayer? You know, it's the earliest cell membrane that came about, and it's this permeable sort of mis has miscibility, which means that biomolecules can move over it and through it. And through that process, the forest can actually kind of communicate because it communicates its inner states to you when you're in it. And guess what? You're communicating your inner state to it because it also has that same phospholipid bilayer. And it's so we're constantly sort of like reminding ourselves that that we are part of this this family and so that i think that is how we maintain the sense of being human and nature at the same time and as we create maybe that maybe that's maybe i maybe i wrote into your question but that's the that's the question i want to answer so <laughs> I mean, I, I, so <laughs> and, and i would just add i mean he just gave you a little nugget of like what it's like to go on a hike with him because like what happens before he dives into to that is he gets so excited. He turns into like a seven-year-old and gets so excited about something that he's seen in the forest and we get excited and then he jumps into the science and I like, I'm like listening and trying to retain it, but also like getting this like phenomenological experience. And so like, it's, it's not a linear, like we do this and then I go make the work and then right. he writes the thing. Right. It's this very organic back and forth. It's and true collaboration. Yeah, like yeah. And so like, you know, we had a whole conversation about the labels in the show where we were like, do we put separate labels or what do we call the, the text and the art? Like, because the text is not describing the art. The text is not telling you what the art means. The text is like parallel playing just in the way. Like we're like, how can we make the art be me and the text be you just in the way that it happens when we go on a hike. How can we do that? And, and that's kind of what we try to do. And, and, and then I'll also just maybe add that there's, there's a whole uh, pair of panels that talks about kind of left brain, right brain, um, that kind of whole conversation and that's going on right now in neuroscience and um, that, that his text panels kind of trigger the thought that like, oh, these are going to give me an answer to this art that I don't understand. But in fact, they, they're they poetic and scientific and like their narrative, like they also are liminal. <laughs> um, and so they actually just soften that kind of quantitative left brain being yeah, that we've trying been to disrupt the, the left brain hijack that happens yeah like we've been trained to kind of go operate in the world in this left brain way whether we like it or not we all kind of are affected by this training and so the his panel is trying to soften that so that you can then re-enter the art in a way that's just a little bit softened that maybe you couldn't enter it before because you weren't yet soft so so these are all sort of the things that we were trying to figure out and it's you know it, yeah again let us know if it works <laughs> Other other questions? We're pretty much out of time, but we could. There's another another question, and and Jane, I see your comment there, and really wanna. I think it's showing up because it, even though it was direct to me, it's showing up because my texts are up there. So yes, <laughs> let's talk. Um, and and I I definitely wanna hear more for sure. Um, Thank you. <laughs> great. great. Um, well, thank you both. And thank you to my colleagues who um, came to the museum with, with this idea of, of partnering on this NEH Spotlight on the Humanities and Sustainability Studies grant. I feel like we've, uh, I at least think we've, we've kicked this off in a, in a really interesting and, and thought-provoking way. And